to the gallery. Michael Blanche, and it's a pleasure to see you all here for this exhibition from the estate of Hilda Rix Nicholas, uh, unarguably one of the greatest Australian artists and regarded by many as the preeminent female artists of all. Judged as such by the Australian National Gallery in Canberra when they put her on the cover of their majestic exhibition three years ago, the 156 women who changed art in Australia. I might add that when Hilda moved to France in 1907, the competition, and remember that she was being bought by the cream of Parisian society, but the competition included Picasso, Braque, <laughs> Matisse, Renoir happened to be still painting, Bon Art and Vuillard were doing a little bit, Cezanne was still around, Monet of course was doing water lilies, and I'm not going to bore you with the next thousand really important artists who were working in Paris at that particular stage. To actually be recognised and acquired by Parisian society was no mean feat. Having said all of that, firstly, let me say how delighted we are to be able to have Hilda's work back in the gallery 20 years after the exhibition to launch the book by John Pickett of Hilda's work, the late John Pickett. Firstly, I would love to acknowledge Bronwyn Wright, the granddaughter of Hilda, for all of the assistance she has been. Bronwyn, where are you? I can't see you. There you are. <laughs> all of the assistance. All of the assistance. This, this has been genuinely a labour of love because Bronwyn has made it very much her life's work to ensure that her grandmother is represented in every major collection in the country in length, in length and depth. And she's done that job brilliantly. So, Bronwyn, thank you so very much for trusting us with your treasures. So the rest of the family, uh, some of whom are here today, welcome to the gallery, those who have not been here before. And I do hope that you love seeing uh, your famous family members' work, I hope, beautifully displayed. I would now like also to thank Dr. Sarah Engeldau, who wrote the article which is contained in the catalogue, which I think that everybody has a copy of. If you haven't read it, I strongly recommend that you do. There are a number of books out on Hilda. This encapsulates some elements of Hilda's life. Catherine Nunn. Catherine is somebody who has rebought back from a little bit of uh, grime and uh, the accumulation of uh, decades of knock-along dust. <laughs> Some of the pictures that we're able to enjoy this afternoon. Catherine, thank you so much. Jan Piggott, the widow of John Piggott. Jan, thank you so much for all of your help with regard to putting this exhibition on. Uh, you've been incredibly valuable and important to us. Thank you. There are private lenders who have uh, decided to remain anonymous, but I would love to thank them because we fleshed this work out with some works from private collections just to uh, broaden our capacity to better show the length and breadth of Hilda's accomplishments in art. I would also love to thank uh, Ruth Lobb, the gallery manager, without whom nothing is possible. So Ruth, I'm not sure where you are, but uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. And thank you. <laughs> my daughter, Derrida, uh, who's done the photography for this exhibition, apart from ones that we borrowed from the National uh, Library in Canberra. Derrida, thank you so much for all of your wonderful photography. Linton Soda who sprang to the rescue when some later works arrived and needed to, in point of fact, have mounts made in a hell of a hurry. Lyndon, wherever you are, Lyndon, thank you for uh, leaping in. And Peter McEwen, those who've been at this gallery uh, often will remember the wonderful gentleman behind the bar who keeps us all from dying of hunger and thirst. Peter has come down from Bendigo today to be with us. Peter, I do hope this is not your last uh, uh, sojourn at uh, Lorraine Diggins' Fine Art, 
but in any case, it's wonderful to see you. I'm pleased that Gerard has agreed to open this beautiful show. Given his lifelong interest in French culture, as both art historian and art museum director, and especially French visual culture. Indeed, some 10 years ago, the French government awarded him France's highest honour, the Legion of Honour for his lifelong contributions to the study of French art and culture in Australia through his exhibitions about so many French artists, art movements and acquisitions of French art, and of course the study and work undertaken in France by Australian artists. Gerard has mentioned to me that in preparing his remarks for today's opening event, he has noticed some interesting synergies between Hilderich's necklace and the subject of his most recent body of research concerning Melbourne-born musicologist and music publisher Louise Hanson Dyer, who moved from Melbourne to Paris in 1929 and set up the Larbird Press and lived in Paris and Monaco for the rest of her life. Both were essentially Melbourne girls who made France the focal point of their cultural and artistic interests. Both were born in the same year, 1884. Both died within a year of each other, 1961 and 1962. Both went to school in Melbourne, Hilda Ricks to Merton Hall, and Louise Smith, later Louise Dyer, to PLC. I think we can assume that through their schools, both were involved with the very active Melbourne branch of the Alliance Francaise, and both suffered dreadful personal losses in World War I. Hilda Ricks losing her husband, Major George Matson Nicholas, just five short weeks after their wedding in London in 1916. And Louise Dyer losing her beloved brother Louis in action on the Western Front. Her second brother Harold was seriously wounded, but recovered, going on to become Lord Mayor of Melbourne in 1932. We tend to forget what a price Australia paid for that horrendous war, which is totally appropriate in the times we now live in. What both women had in common was a love of all things French, and that drive, ambition and resilience, which to so many Europeans became the hallmark of Australian women in the period after World War I. Louise Hanson Dyer became a prominent publisher of historic and contemporary French and Australian music, and in between, a serious collector of modern art. She was the first Australian to collect works by Picasso. I wish we'd had lots more. <laughs> And I wish they'd stayed in the country and commissioned Marcus Ernst to paint her surrealist portrait. A new book about Louise Hanson Dyer's publishing enterprises is about to be published by Melbourne University's Faculty of Music, and Gerard had contributed three chapters of new research on her activities as an art collector. But now he will share some thoughts on Hilda Riggs Nicholas. May I give you Dr. Gerard Vaughan? Thank you, Michael. The pleasure it's been for me to meet Bronwyn for the first time, and um, this selection is quite remarkable. There are some really superb things here. Um, and I was saying to uh, Michael, there, I think they're very well priced, actually. So you can all, you can all get two, so far as. <laughs> um, but, but, and I would also like to acknowledge um, uh, Michael and Nerida and Ruth for the great work they do um, here at the Rain Diggins Gallery. Now. There's been an enormous rise of interest, of course, in women painters um, in, in recent decades, and Michael's mentioned that series um, at the National Gallery of Australia, which was really conceived after my time as director, but not long after, um, called Know My Name. And it's really just to say there are a lot of women artists who have been underestimated, overlooked, you know, they've passed under the radar um, for a whole range of reasons. Uh, it's a very interesting subject, actually. Um, but when I think about it through my career, it, it started in the 1970s. Um, that was the moment when a whole group of mainly women feminist um, art historians began to revive the careers and knowledge about um, a whole range of um, women artists. And, um, and that was particularly the case at Melbourne University where I was um, through the 70s. And then one of my friends and colleagues from that time, Janine Burke, uh, many of you will remember this, published in 1980, um, an important book called Australian Women Painters. And that sort of was the, from the moment from which everyone started saying there's another whole parallel history um, of Australian art that we've rather <coughs> forgotten about or haven't given enough credit to uh, because, um, and I'm, I'm not commenting on, on, on the Lorraine Diggins Gallery, um, but you know, the Australian art world and particularly the dealers, it was a boys club. 
um, for a very long time. I have to say that because um, everything I know about the period suggests it to me. And of course, one of the early um, people who lifted the reputation of such artists was Jim Alexander, um, with his gallery not too far from here, um, important women artists who, who only passed away um, fairly, fairly recently. So this um, show, I would say, is uh, an, another very significant sort of contribution to this ongoing process of recovering. And, and, and was, well, uh, what I'm going to say in the next few minutes is that Hilda Riggs Nicholas does not need recovering. Um, uh, not at all. She was obviously, as Michael has said, right from the start, she was seen as a gifted artist who was going places. There's no question about that. But after her death, there was a period when she was became another of those very interesting women painters about whom we didn't know all that much. I think that's, that's perhaps the way to put it. And that's how it was when I was a student. But I began to see her works and I always liked them. Um, and I felt that those wonderful sunny early 20th century pre-World War I paintings, and there are so many of them here, because although she was based in Paris, um, she went to Paris in 1907, uh, with her mother, um, Elizabeth, and her sister. Um, they went off to Morocco and they spent time in Tangier and there are some quite fabulous um, um, representations of, of those Moroccan visits in this exhibition. Some are for sale and some are not there lent, either by private collectors or institutions. But what I've been amazed by um, uh, is the group of drawings of the North African period, which are for sale, and, and these are wonderful. I mean, these are all museum quality works. So um, I, I actually thought, Michael, your prices were rather reasonable, I have to say. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but um, look, it's, it's, I think it's a wonderful opportunity in any case for um, everyone to come and see this exhibition and for those of you who are inclined to make acquisitions because this is a very significant group and I suspect from my earlier discussion with Bronwyn that, that there aren't going to be too many groups like this that would ever become available again. Um, so, uh, we had an exhibition at Melbourne University in their gallery in 1999, um, uh, and then when I look at what was going on, there was another big increase in interest in Hilda Riggs Nicholas around 2010. A whole series of exhibitions and um, things were happening um, around her, and of course in the year 2000, um, we have John Pickett's book that's been mentioned, and um, a very important uh, contribution to our understanding um, of um, uh, Hilda Riggs Nicholas, and then of course the more recent um, monograph by Richard Travers, which came out in, uh, 2000 and, in 2021, I should say. Um, so I think that my, my feeling is that all of this has added up to uh, an understanding of the work of, um, um, of Hilda Riggs Nicholas that perhaps we didn't have before, um, and now it's out there. And I think that everyone is reassessing, rethinking, and agreeing that she was absolutely one of the great, great female artists um, of the 20th century, um, so far as um, Australia is concerned. Um, there was an exhibition at Mossman Gallery in 2014. I didn't see it, but I gather it was a very good one. Um, but there was one critic who happens to be a pal of mine, so I'm not going to mention his name, um, who said in his review, he loved the work, but the question on his mind is what I've just seen, does that put her in the category of one of the greatest artists um, of our time. And he said, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just waiting a bit, and I'll, I'll keep studying and thinking about it. Um, but I would suggest to you that what has happened since 2014 and the enormous growth of interest in the art of Hilda Ritz Nicholas um, is, is something that needs to be uh, thought about. There's, of course, a new focus on her as a war artist. And that makes sense uh, because we had a five-year rolling commemoration, of course, of the First World War from 2014 to 2018. Um, and there was a lot happening. And when I was at the NGA, who's director, we did three exhibitions around the visual culture of the First World War. And of course, Hilda Ricks Nicholas was very much uh, a part of that. We also did a very interesting show on the um, war paintings, the First World War paintings of Arthur Streeton, because he was a um, an official war artist. Interestingly, unlike in Canada, um, Arthur, um, the Australians did not appoint any female war artists. Um, they did in the Second World War, but not, not in the First World War. Well, um, so there's a new, a new attention, as I've suggested, um, to the work of Hilda. And um, 
particularly those exhibitions that occurred in those years, um, 2014 to 2018, um, her paintings and drawings of the diggers, the Australian diggers, really got attention. Um, and she came back to Australia. Um, she was in England, um, where she married, of course, um, uh, Major George Nicholas, but as Michael has said, um, it was in five weeks after their wedding, he was killed in action um, on the Western Front, which was a, a, an appalling sort of disaster for her personally. Um, so, well, um, my, my feeling is that that grief that she felt is one of the reasons why we've been thinking about her anew um, and, the, the, and looking again at the works that she produced in England um, during the First World War and then some, of course, after 1918 when she returned to um, Australia. And the Great War Images is a kind of triptych pro humanitates or pro, pro humanitate, I should say, a triptych with that wonderful, you may have seen the, uh, reproductions of it, the central figure is um, a, a soldier who was probably, um, he, he is being blown backwards. It's, he's seen effectively from behind with his arms outstretched. So there's obviously um, uh, a kind of visual reference to the crucifixion, there's no doubt about that. Um, but it's a very powerful image. Sadly, that and some other works of that period were destroyed by fire. Um, in 1930, so we don't, uh, we don't have them anymore. But the, the, that great sense of grief, of desolation, um, and of loss, which absolutely marks her art um, from that period. And uh, Paul Pathan, uh, a very good, fine art historian here in Melbourne, had, had published a book in 2020 called For the Fallen. Now the reason for doing the book was the um, State Library of Victoria competition to have a mural painting that commemorated the fallen in the war. Um, and with, obviously for things like the Shrine of Remembrance, a vast building, um, that took another 10 years. It didn't open until 1934. So this was the very first public commemoration uh, for the fallen. And when you read his book, it is absolutely full of references to Hilda Ricks Nicholas. From page one, page five, page 10, 15 pages in the middle of the book and, and on it goes. And I think it shows that there's been this enormous shift since I was a student at university in realizing that uh, Hilda Riggs Nicholas is right up there. And uh, the competition, you know, an enormous number of artists uh, put in to win it because um, it came with a very big prize. And in that period after the First World War, um, money was very important to artists. But Hilda came in third. She was, there was a final shortlist and she was number three. But she was up against all of the contemporary artists of any note um, in Australia at the time. And that also, I think, tells us quite a lot about her reputation. Um, well, um, I, I think that um, I'll never forget, and I'll, I'll wrap up with this, there are different um, periods of her work. She came back to her, she went back to Paris in 24 and stayed for a couple of years. And there she painted one of the greatest masterpieces, I think, of the National Gallery of Australia. Um, it's called Les Fleurs des Daniers. Um, and it's a, it's a painting of a woman in um, a beautiful neo 18th century dress who has thrown a bunch of flowers onto the ground. So it's an angry woman, it's a woman who is making her own decisions. It's incredibly beautiful. It's unique in her oeuvre. And I do wonder uh, whether if she had decided that this was a direction to go, I would put it to you that her reputation today would not just be an Australian reputation, notwithstanding the fact that you know, she exhibited for the Royal Academy at the New Salon and the French state bought a couple of her works um, from her exhibitions in Paris, um, I think she'd have a European and, and global reputation. Uh, it is so good. And um, just Google it um, when, when, you, when you get home. It's, it's an amazing thing. And when we put it out, when I was um, up in Canberra, um, the, the curator said, we, we've had some of these war drawings, but let's get out this wonderful, wonderful painting, an, an enigmatic painting um, by her. The public went mad, it was astonishing. From day one, when this picture went up in the galleries, there were crowds of people around it, everyone was taking a selfie with it in the background, um, everyone was talking about it, and our comms people were able to track it um, on, on the internet, and it went global. It, it was all over the world, and the number of hits from that point on, um, on the NGA website, looking at Hilda Ricks Nicholas, was truly astounding. Um, and I think that says it all. I mean, that, that if, if we're talking about 
the shifts in taste and the periods whereby, um, you know, when she was held in high esteem and known, and those when she was a bit out of, out of fashion, but she's back with a vengeance. My final comment today is just this. Um, I thought her late works are all about um, being the wife of a pastoralist, working in Australia, working um, you know, on, 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 on a farm. They're, they're beautiful, wonderful pictures, flooded with light, and she sent some exhibitions to France and to England showing these. But one of the things that I've had on my mind as a director is to curate an exhibition with, that, with the imagery of Australia and how Australia wanted to present itself in that period between uh, the World Wars. Uh, through the 1920s and especially into the 1930s. And uh, Hilda Rix's, Rix Nicholas's paintings are quite sensational um, from this period. Um, they show, you know, Stockman and her own husband. Um, um, she remarried, of course, in, 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 in uh, 1928 uh, with their son Rix, uh, Bronwyn's uh, father, um, whose portrait is here. And, um, uh, and I think there'd be a brilliant exhibition to make with Hilda Rixnickers at the centre, as the centrepiece of the show, but looking at other artists, we've had a bit of it with that Late Street and Show that was on a few years ago, you know, um, the land of the Golden Fleece, that idea of flocks of sheep and the, the wealth of Australia, the climate and the enjoyment of it, and also works like Daryl Lindsay, the Stockman, the, the pastoralist's daughter, for example, the squatter's daughter. Um, that'd be a great show. So, look, um, and enjoy this exhibition. It really is significant. There, I have to be honest, and I'm going to say it a second time now, there are real opportunities here, because it won't come along again. I mean, th th there are wonderful works on paper, especially, um, that are very well priced, I have to say, as a direct <laughs> form. <laughs> I was always dealing, I was always dealing with um, curators saying, we have to buy this, we have to buy that. Um, so I've got a fairly well honed idea of what things are. And um, I think the prices, <laughs> the prices are good, that's what I'm saying. Um, and so, on that final, very optimistic note, um, I would like um, to declare the exhibition open. <laughs> I wonder if I could, uh, on behalf of the gallery and everybody here, thank Gerard for all those wonderful words. Before I hand over to Gerard the, uh, the present, which is customary for guest speakers of uh, his calibre, which, by the way, I might add, comes from the the wonderful Wyoming Scotsman's Hill, which a few people around the room might be slightly familiar with. I forgot earlier on to thank Bronwyn for lending us the costume here, which is, of course, featured in the wonderful painting of Elsie painted at the top in 1930. The costume, we believe, is possibly late Ching, or alternatively, with regard to Tony Preston, it may possibly be Ottoman. Certainly made by uh, Hilda herself. The headdress uh, over here, below the study for the masterpiece in the Art Gallery of West Australia, and the other dress, which is over behind Serge. And of course, you see that in the nursery rhymes, the one on the bottom left hand side. So, Bronwyn, I was so thrilled when you managed to find those. Because being able to reunite for this picture, Elsie mm -hmm. in the dress. Mm -hmm. yeah. The painting of Elsie, which we believe was bought by the Worth family in 1913 and then went missing. Hilda uh, with uh, Ricks at Knockalong in about 1944-45. And the dress, and to be able to put them all together, was for us a real curatorial pleasure. Mm -hmm. So please enjoy the exhibition. Thank you all so much for coming. And Gerard, it is my pleasure to pass over to you a bottle of the current holder of the Royal Melbourne Wine Trophy for the best Gerards in Australia, the Scotsman's Hill 2021. Thank you very much.